us in our thoughts be your Holy Spirit and you may lead us more to Jesus. So the reading this morning is Mark chapter 1, verses 1 to 15, and I wonder if you'd like to read along in the English and Bible. Mark chapter 1. John the Baptist prepares the way. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptised by him in the, river Jordan, in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptise you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness for forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. From reading our passage, first question we should ask ourselves is why was it necessary that John the Baptist had, why was his, necess, why was his ministry necessary? I think John the Baptist was a herald of Christ. He came to bear witness to him and to prepare the way before him. In times of old, I understand, when kings travelled they sent their heralds before them to announce the coming king, to prepare the way for the king. I was very pleased um, yesterday talking to my daughter. She remembered what I spoke on before, which was actually from the Book of Malachi. She didn't remember what I said, but she did remember I talked on the Book of Malachi. And what I said previously from Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, was that he said, See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, of the Lord's coming. So John the Baptist was a herald. He was sent before Jesus, the King. But he was in the wilderness. And I guess the word wilderness conjures up all sorts of images in our minds. Going out into the wilderness would no doubt make us feel unsecure, insecure, lonely, isolated, and probably uncomfortable. But John, that's where John was preaching, out in the wilderness. A 
And yet, in verse 5, it tells us that the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, went out to John the Baptist. And if the wilderness is this place that makes people feel uncomfortable, why were so many people going out to hear John the Baptist? What was his message? Well, our reading tells us he was coming as a herald to bring the message of repentance. He was preparing the way before the great and awesome day of the Lord. So, not only did the people perhaps feel uncomfortable being out in the wilderness, but hearing John's John preaching must be the ultimate recipe for being feeling completely uncomfortable. Not only are you in an isolated, scary, lonely place, but you are now having John <coughs> about sin and repentance. Perhaps those of you who know me, I may have uh, major too much on uh, using the, the, the verse from Malachi, the great and awesome day of the Lord. Or dreadful and a great day of the Lord. And perhaps because I talk about sin, perhaps I made you too much on the dreadful element of that sentence. But this morning, I want to focus on the great day of the Lord. Because actually, just as Mark opens the passage, this is good news. The coming of Jesus Christ into the world is good news. And therefore, it is a great day. It's a really great day. The first coming of Jesus uh, was great. It's good news. His name uh, means Saviour. The name of Jesus is Saviour. We read that in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. We're reading the often here at Christmas. She will give birth to him. Mary will give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus. Because he will save his people from their sins. It really is good news. And this day, the day when we can get to know Jesus, is, a, is, a, is good news. It's possible that we can know him and have our sins forgiven. Jesus said it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Equally, it's not the righteous who need a saviour, but sinners. I fear that too much of what mainstream Christianity preaches these days ignores the very real need of us, the people. Our need, my need, of a saviour. Just an aside, perhaps this is the reason why churches are struggling and Christianity could be marginalised. We have perhaps as a church, I mean that the global church, holistic church, perhaps concentrated too much on our physical uh, requirements rather than our spiritual need. I think that was really evident perhaps in the COVID pandemic. Churches were forced to shut. We weren't allowed to come and pray or worship God. But if the church had a food bank, it was allowed to be open. What a twist that the spiritual need the spiritual element of what we're all about, we were forbidden from doing anything. But if we were giving food out, which is all very good and proper, I'm not saying we're not food banks, but the church was allowed to open. Perhaps the church has focused too much on our material need and not on our spiritual need. As Christians, let us acknowledge our sinnership because this will remind us of our spiritual need. If we're sinners and we recognise that, we will recognise that we need a saviour, a great day of the Lord. And perhaps if the church focuses on our, on our spiritual need, we may have a genuine spiritual conversions. There's so many churches which are losing people, but if we're not giving them what they really need, there's people that are hungry and that type of things. But if we give them real 
spiritual uh, spirituality become a great real discipleship, a real conversion. The ninth article of the uh, Church of England, so there's 39 articles or 39 statements which uh, the Church of England, the Anglican Church, is based on. And uh, I believe James, the vicar here, was the last one who had to learn um, the 39 articles for his to pass his um, uh, qualification. After that, they actually said that's not part of the, their training, which is a great shame. Um, but the ninth article talks about that sin, we talk about our need of God, that sin is much more than just actions or much more than just our omissions. That sin is actually to do with our disposition. That is, the things of, of who we are, things that we were born with, things like pride and self confidence and unbelief. I shall read the, the ninth article to you. Original sin, so that sin that we were born with, is not merely in the following of Adam's example. It is rather to be seen in the fault and corruption which is found in the nature of every person who is naturally descended from Adam. The consequence of this is that man is foregone from his original state of righteousness. In his own nature, he is predisposed to evil, the sinful nature in man, always desiring to behave in a manner contrary to the spirit. <coughs> in every person born into this world, there is found this predisposition, which rightly deserves God's anger and condemnation. This infection within man's nature persists even within those who are regenerate. At the church prayer meeting on a Thursday, we have a club there, 7 o'clock in the church hall every week, we often discuss, with some of them, we sometimes discuss our sin, in the first class, and grapple with the dichotomy between the consciousness of our personal sin condition opposed to the knowledge that we are forgiven. Further, that God remembers our sin no more. That doesn't mean he's forgotten it, it's just he chooses not to remember it then. So the dichotomy is, do we mope around as miserable sinners, woe is me, I'm a miserable sinner, or do we glory in our forgiveness? I think both sides of the coin, both facets, are really important. Because if we don't know where we've come from, we certainly won't value what Christ has done for us. So we are a sinner who has been saved by grace. I think it's also important that we allow God to search our lives and reveal our true state to us. Culture, unfortunately today, reduces sin to nearly an irrelevance. In fact, We've heard in the prayers, we have to look onto the television news and newspapers and see that actually sin is often paraded as something good. It's utterly wicked and disgusting. <coughs> I'm reading lots of sort of reformed Christian literature, which include, often includes uh, testimonies of people who labour through their burden of sin. Seeking relief through God's mercy and forgiveness. This is perhaps a facet of discipleship that we don't really have in mainstream Christianity. Because did you hear the language of both Mark, who quoted Isaiah, and Jesus himself? In verse 3, with Mark saying, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And Jesus, in verse 15, Repent. And believe the good news. If these passages were rewritten in mainstream evangelicalism, that is a language, 
Would we not read something like, Would you like to accept Jesus? Put your hand up. Have him into your heart. Prepare the way for the Lord, or as Jesus says, repent and believe. This is not something that we can see very quickly. We put our hand up and then we all go off down the pub together. Repentance and discipleship. Learning how to uh, change behaviour and to grow in faith. This is real discipleship. It's something that may be sadly missing here today. In Matthew 3, verse 14, John the Baptist appears surprised and perplexed why Jesus himself wanted to be baptised. Jesus wasn't a sinner. And yet water baptism is all about repentance. So why did Jesus want to be baptised by John? Water baptism is much about dying to self and having new birth. Jesus humbled himself so that he gave, uh, followed in obedience to the example that we should follow. But for us, it's not just about obedience. For us, it's that we follow Jesus' example and that we are baptised into his death, into the death of Jesus, and into his resurrected life. We're born again into, uh, into Jesus' life. And by the way, the sacrament, uh, which water baptism is, is an outward sign of an inner working. And anyone who believes and trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Saviour and their Lord can be baptised. As a church, we're being encouraged to think about our evangelism and our uh, um, strategy, if you like, to go out and, and to share the good news, the good news that Jesus can forgive us of our sins. I think within that whole strategy, it's important that we consider baptism, water baptism, we read in Matthew 28 verses 19 and 20 Jesus says therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you let's pray that we see more requirements of water baptism this is something that uh, God, God wants us to be doing. Slightly moving on in verse 8, there are two distinct baptisms. They can be mutually amalgamated, but that's not entirely necessary. Firstly, it's what we've been considering. The first baptism is the baptism of water, the baptism of repentance, or John's baptism, however it's described. In the second, John talks about, uh, verse 8, I baptise you with water, but Jesus, he, will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. So there is this other baptism, the baptism when the Holy Spirit comes into our mortal bodies. So the Spirit of Jesus coming into us. Some people find all this very confusing. Because we know that God is omnipresent, which means God is everywhere, and yet perhaps what we don't have, what we have a, a distinct lack of, of his manifest presence. When God comes in power, perhaps it could be like at Pentecost, uh, when there's a ferocious wind that comes in, and fire and flames of fire on people's heads, and uh, it was like an earthquake, walls shook. No one could misunderstand that this was not uh, something supernatural that was going on. But it doesn't have to be like that. It could be just that still, small, sweet presence of Jesus when we just know that He is with us. And that's a little bit like how Jesus was anointed with the Spirit, with the Holy Spirit. As we read, that Jesus was baptised by John in the River Jordan. 
and the Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove onto him. This whole verse of the Holy Spirit descending like a dove has, uh, is a shadow of Noah's Ark, actually. So Noah, the flood was over the world, and Noah was in his ark. And he opened the window out the first time and let a, a dove out. And the dove, you can read in the book of Genesis, uh, the dove flew here, here and there. He couldn't find anywhere to land, and so quickly returned to Noah. So Noah took the dove in. And that's like the Holy Spirit in Old Testament times. The Holy Spirit was sent out, oh, but there was nowhere for the Holy Spirit to abide or to rest on, to perch on. And then Noah sent the dove out the second time. And the dove flew around and returned a little bit later on with a, an olive tree, a twig in its beak. And that was as if it landed on Jesus' olive bit. So yeah, it landed on an olive tree and obviously the water was receding. That for us, the analogy is, well, that's Jesus. So the Holy Spirit was sent out, and Jesus was someone who the Holy Spirit could perch on. But as we heard, was it 12 days ago now, that Jesus ascended into heaven. And so Jesus and the anointing went back to his Father. But then at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out, and that's exactly uh, what the third dove when Noah sent one out. Because that dove went out and didn't return. And so for us, the Holy Spirit has been poured out. He hasn't returned to heaven. But the disciples were saying, were told, to tarry in Jerusalem, to wait, to seek that anointing, the full power of God. And as a side to side, just what we were worshipping earlier, I think it's Romans, uh, Romans 5 verse 5, where the Holy Spirit is about the love of God. I mean, you know, we, we talk about the Holy Spirit, and I sense that perhaps not all of us know him, and that he's the spirit of love. Well, really it. It's Romans 5. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. So, if there's anyone here, doesn't really know the love of God, then actually there is opportunity for us all to know Him and to know God's love in our hearts. It's very real. But in our day, we need to be people who seek that manifest presence of God. When there's no doubt whether the presence of Jesus is, is with us or not. We want to see. We cannot do anything on our own but without, without Him thought about all the kind of materialism and we've done all that physical side of stuff. It hasn't really worked. What we actually need is to tarry and to seek that anointing of God, the Spirit of Jesus, to completely empower our lives that we may bring glory to Him. I'll come on to that point. Because today, I don't know if you know or not, is, uh, is Trinity Sunday. It's the time when the church remembers and celebrates uh, the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God, <coughs> three in one and one in three. And the passage of which we've read, and it's really why the passage is given today, is that it shows how the Trinity, our God, works in unity together, but also how they seek to bring glory to each other. So all the way through the Bible, there's uh, references to how, to how the Holy Spirit's desire is to bring glory to Jesus, and how Jesus wants to bring glory to the Father, and how the Father wants to glorify Jesus. And so for us, what am I, you know, everyone in a sermon wants to know, what can we do, what can we take away as a do? Well, our doing thing is we want to bring glory to Jesus, we want to bring glory to the Father, we want to bring glory to the Holy Spirit. So just to give you some references, John 16 verse 14, He, the Holy Spirit, shall glorify me, this is Jesus speaking, for he shall receive of mine and show it unto you. And John
from 17 verse 1. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. And in our reading, Mark chapter 1, one verse 11, it says, And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. And with you I am well pleased. So how did the Father glorify the Son? He loved him. You are my Son, whom I love. Likewise, how do we do that thing at glorifying the Trinity? For we love them. We love the Father. We love Jesus the Son. And we love the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus. And Charles Spurgeon said, or once said, every good thing that the sinner wants is found in the Father. What greater way what better way than to show our love for God than to lead sinners to him, to share the good news, and it is good news, with others who don't yet know him. And then perhaps we can go off and baptise, or we can see baptisms, that they will accept, those people, those sinners will accept Jesus, will see the good news, and that we can baptise them in the name of the Father and of the Son. And of the Holy 